I'm biased by having been interested in this subject uh, since before uh, uh, the term net neutrality uh, was introduced. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm biased by, by, by trying to push the question uh, why net neutrality should be the thing we care about. Um, uh, which is to say roughly the following story. So here's a story. And the story goes roughly like this. Um, in the first half of the 1990s, there was a growing understanding that uh, telecommunications networks uh, had significant demand-side economies of scale. If you wanted, that is to say, network effects. If you wanted uh, uh, competition, uh, as you transition from incumbents everywhere, usually state incumbents in the US, uh, 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 the telcos, uh, um, you needed to allow competitors to share their facilities. Uh, <coughs> the most controversial uh, uh, but significant one was unbundling, that is to say, allowing competitors to use the actual physical infrastructure that was hard to replicate bring in their new physical infrastructure and connect to it, because that's how you would get competition. You would get competition from people who would actually build facilities ever closer to the home so that you could get redundant networks on which there would be competition. The big question was what would happen with, uh, and this was generally the model, though it was attacked on all, uh, 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 in the courts by the bills, uh, but the big question was what would happen with cable. And around 2000, the trend was toward equalizing in the direction of open access. That is to say, we had a few cable franchising authorities, most famous among them Portland, uh, 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 beginning to pass uh, uh, requirements in franchise agreements. You had the, the, the federal court say, no, you can't do that. That's up to the FCC. But creating a basic condition that understands carriage as telecommunications, and then content as a service onto it. And we needed to think of it as telecommunications. And between November 2001 and May of 2002, roughly, a series of, of initial decisions come out, uh, uh, or reports come out from the FCC, that begin to say, no, actually, what we want is to shift from this idea that each pipe should be competitive, and we should get multiple competitors. Oh, by the way, the other major thing was in the AOL Time Warner merger. AOL was required to offer uh, access to at least three other competitors in various uh, cities, again, on the model of beginning to move toward open access, which was the cable version. During that period, suddenly the shift conceptually was from competition on each wire to competition between these two wires. The notion that duopoly competition was the model and moving away from open access. That's, I think, when once people pretty much gave up on the idea of actual physical competition by connecting and being able to lease certain network elements as necessary and connecting on the line side for the uh, close to the home and replicating the most expensive components and being, bringing in uh, the best uh, electronics close to the home and actually allowing competition, it's when the fallback was to basically we're not going to have competition on any one. We're just going to have these two. Uh, that net neutrality became the idea, okay, we're not going to have competition on each wire, but let's at least assure um, uh, 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 a neutral stance by the owner of the infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis the content. And my basic question, when I want to open the conversation, I'll be curious to hear why you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, if not in your initial comments then later right. on, but also around the room is, there are many policies that were passed between January of 2001 and January of 2008 that will need to be revised. There is much disagreement about many of these policies. What is it about this policy that doesn't allow us to go back and ask, why can't we have actual competition in physical infrastructure as one main model? And to do that, like many other places in the world, you may need to require the owners of the infrastructure to open it up to a great extent to competitors, not just the content, but actually allowing people to lease components and get in there and begin to open unbundling again. Question one. Question two, do we need an alternative workaround infrastructure that is public? Municipal broadband, be it fiber to the home, be it fiber uh, wireless. Three, should we be focusing on user 
own infrastructure. That is to say, either wireless mesh by changing spectrum policy to allow people to buy a device, start it up, and then create their own local loop, which then anybody else can come and connect the yeah. internet to it, or some combination of condominium fiber, where people buy their own fiber the way they buy their own water lines, connecting to a public main that runs yeah. in the main, or to a competitive main that runs in the main. Yeah. The imagination moving beyond regulation at the margins of what the monopolist owner of the pipe is, toward a set of policy interventions that will mean that there will be multiple pipelines, some private, some public, and that the discipline will come from the possibility of competition between these genuine physical facilities. That's my question. Right. Should I go next? Okay. Well, I can use this. Oh, okay. He's going to do this. Hi, my name is uh, Tim Wu. I'm a sort of uh, I forced my way onto the panel, <laughs> and uh, you know, I just twist our arms. Yes, twist our arms. <laughs> ask me so many, uh, ask so many interesting questions. I'm tempted to abandon uh, what I was going to talk about. Uh, I want to say first of all, I it's great to be back at uh, Berkman Center. I was actually an alumni. I was a student here when it founded, and I don't. I was an RA for this strange new professor named Larry Lessig, who was you know, kind of this kooky character, and um, the Berkman Center was like three people, and it's really amazing what it is now. And I want to say in this field, I'm incredibly, uh, you know, my own work in this field does come after Yochai and, and David Eisenberg, who's sitting here, and, and uh, Larry, and all these other people who got this way before me. Um, what I thought I'd do is I just want to talk about sort of where I think this issue is exactly right now, and where, what's going to happen this year, what a, and just put that out for there, sort of a snapshot of where I think net neutrality is right now, and I want to talk about four things, four uh, issues which I think are at the front of Tim work yeah, neutrality. Yeah, just a second. What's hold the, the mic a little further from you. Put it on your jacket. Oh, it's too loud? Yeah, it's yeah. too loud. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thanks. Okay, so I think there's four, I want to talk about what I think are the four questions that are the defining questions of network neutrality. Uh, right now, or you could say internet regulation or network regulation. The first is this question of payments and whether or not service providers are going to be able to demand payments for delivering access to their customers. So right now the way the internet works and the way we've always assumed it is is you sort of pay money to get on the internet. Here I am at home, I pay $40 a month to AT&T, then I'm on the internet. Now these guys over here, based on end-to-end -end design, they're called eBay, they happen to pay a million dollars a month to get on online, but then they are then online, and then we do whatever we want, right? That's the sort of design. And the, the big question is whether, one way of understanding the big issue of net neutrality is whether or not AT&T, which has this customer base of about 500 million, uh, 50 million people, can demand money to reach its customers. Right? Whether it can say, oh, do you want to reach these people? Well, we'd like, you know, somewhere on the aggregate, some kind of cash payment to reach our customers. You can call this a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways of describing this, but I think this pricing issue is censured to a lot of what the future net neutrality debates will be over. You know, this is sometimes called a fast lane by its detractors. It's called a payola scheme. It's called a lot of different things. But then one of the huge questions at the bottom of network neutrality is whether or not you can demand that payment. Now, this is a payment that these guys and the cable industry are very accustomed to getting. When you're talking about telephony, this is called an access fee. You know, they charge people to, sorry. In telephony, this is called an access fee, where you, you charge people to reach your customers, long distance carriers. And that's a regulated price because of the possibility of abusing this since you have, remember that what you have here is a form of monopoly. You have not a real, a normal monopoly, but you have a termination monopoly. That is to say, if you want to reach me, you have no choice but to go through AT&T, or if you want to reach AT&T's 10 million customers, however many it is, probably 50 million something, 
you have to go and deal with them. So they'd like to be able to charge that fee. Um, what net neutrality advocates, and, and if you're a cable company, you're also used to this in the sense that you know, you're used to the idea that people want to reach, uh, if content providers want to reach your customers, they got to, you know, they have to work through you. And that, that's basically what this, this fee is all about. Um, so one of the big questions is whether or not this fee will be charged. And most of the network neutrality proposals that are in legislation have some kind of rule saying this fee can't be charged. Okay, so that's what I think is the first question that's in debate right now. The second is this issue which has been highlighted by Comcast, this question of what is reasonable network management. When can a carrier delay or, or, or block or somehow mess with a connection between two parties on the internet in, in the purposes of managing bandwidth? And this, I think, is evolving towards this is my read of, of the hearing that was here at Harvard. I think it's evolving towards something where unilateral approaches are not accepted. And if you take an approach to network management, it must be multilateral, or it must involve all of the relevant players on the internet. The one thing I was very struck by here at the, the panel that was um, an FCC hearing was this sense that what the people who are designers of the internet object to the most is a carrier single-handedly deciding that they're going to manage, network, you know, manage traffic from this point in the network as opposed to involving everybody who has this problem of, 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 uh, of traffic working together. You know, so unilateral solutions, I imagine the future will be unallowed, but with the possibility of multilateral solutions being acceptable, which is sort of the way the internet's always worked. The third issue that I think is the issue right now is, you know, if there is some kind of floating net neutrality norm that is sometimes enforced by the FCC, what is the form of the scheme going to take? This is something Yohai and I were just sort of talking about. Is it just going to be an ad hoc, if the FCC sees something it doesn't like, it does something about it type of system? My guess is, you know, the next administration may be different, but my guess is we are laying the groundwork right now for exactly that system, for better or for worse. That is, something where net neutrality sort of remains this concept that, that floats out there that you're not supposed to transgress, and when you do, you get fined. What exactly the rule is, is defined in a somewhat vague way, and, and you have something like a common law um, development of what are acceptable and unacceptable practices by, uh, by network carriers. That's what things seem to be going in the current time, as far as I can tell. Um, we can have a debate whether that's a good administrative structure or not, but my sense is that's where the things are going, where most of the regulation is by hearings, by sort of ad hoc orders, and by regulatory threat, as opposed to rules process and those kind of things. This is where I, I, I feel that, that this is going. I think there's some reasons to defend that approach. It's faster. Uh, it doesn't, obviously, it has, if you're a first fan of sort of legal process, you may, or, or very clear rules, you may not like it. But I think maybe that, that is the direction things are going. And the fourth thing I want to say is, um, the fourth question I think is really on the, on the, on the ground right now, is, or that people are thinking about actively or is, is out there, is this Hollywood issue. The question is, what does Hollywood think of network neutrality? What side is the content industry on? This is a very sort of base political question. Uh, in a lot of ways, Hollywood is in the same position that eBay is in, in the sense that they are, you know, just imagine this being a studio. Um, a studio. Is there also, there's this question of whether they're going to be, you know, they're going to make an, a, another a payment to the last mile carrier, or they're going to be asked for that kind of payment. And the question is, what do they think about that? And I don't think Hollywood's made up its mind. In the sense, I think the content industries like 
they're kind of torn because on the one hand they don't want they're they're hesitant to get engaged with another set of with a set of powerful gatekeepers like the, the telephone companies and so they don't like that part about it. Uh, on the other hand, any system where if they pay more they get advantages over other people is the traditional Hollywood way of doing business. If you look at the history of the theaters and, and control of theaters. And so I think Hollywood right now is kind of not clear. There's also this copyright issue. Sometimes there's been a conflation of the net neutrality issue with the copyright issue, and Hollywood is obvious stances about that. But right now, Hollywood is, is divided over this issue as to whether they want to let these people have power over them or whether they think they can manipulate the situation to their advantage. So this year, I think there's going to be a kind of struggle in the basically policy community to get, to get, get the allegiance of the people who own content. So that's where I think net neutrality is at this exact uh, at this exact moment. So, Terry, why don't you take since he's uh, yeah. <coughs> So I think I can be pretty brief because uh, Yochai and Tim have pretty well covered most of the things I would be inclined to say. Um, unlike them, I'm for the most part a consumer rather than a generator of this literature. But my sense is the uh, discussion in this area could be enhanced with some more clarity concerning what our objectives are and what, how the various arguments for and against net neutrality match up with them. So just by way of taxonomy, it seems to me there are in the literature these six different conceptions of network neutrality, of which the first four are the leading candidates. They're different, and they're often conflated. So the first one is content neutrality. The idea here is if you were committed to this principle, you would forbid ISPs to block or slow packets on the basis of what, when reassembled, they say. Second is application neutrality. This is perhaps the strongest form. This is the bits are bits are bits idea. Each ISP must carry and relay each packet in the same way, at the same speed, at the same <coughs> price, regardless of the purpose or function of those packets. Third is sender neutrality which would permit ISPs to d differentiate among types of packets or purposes, but must treat all senders identically. So couldn't discriminate, for example, against other firms engaging in the same kind of service, like voice over IP that they engage in. Fourth is the one that Tim referred to in his, I guess, second point, which is the toll-free idea, the preservation of the custom that ISPs don't charge senders, they charge recipients. So there are some others, but I think those are the four that are most um, salient in the literature. And it helps to separate them out because then when you turn to the question of why we should or should not allow discrimination, the different arguments have different degrees of force depending upon which definition of network neutrality you pick. So the advocates of allowing discrimination on the part of the ISPs make as their principal claims that discrimination in general is efficient, that the market should be making decisions about the speed and allocation of transmissions over the internet, that the ISPs have freedom of speech rights of their own, and they make an historical argument about the absence of um, neutrality, uh, and occasionally a moral argument here. Uh, the advocates of network neutrality, by contrast, um, emphasize the capacity of ISPs in the current market to leverage local monopoly power and to control of other markets, which goes returns directly to Yochai's point. This, that, that assumes a baseline that is potentially up for grabs. That we need to preserve opportunities for innovation on the internet. That otherwise major content providers will cut deals with ISPs that will solidify their oligopolistic power. So this presumes one of the two divides in the Hollywood debate that you were yeah. discussing. Um, 
And then these two arguments here are much less common in the debate, but they concern the preservation of opportunities for amateurism and semiotic democracy in the environment. So if you put these together, you get a map that looks something like this. So those are the different conceptions of network neutrality. And here are the arguments for allowing discrimination. The efficiency argument and the let the market decide ones are the strongest. And here are the arguments against allowing discrimination. We're, we should be worried about leveraging local monopoly power. That's especially salient in the context of application neutrality. We want to preserve innovation on the internet. We want to avoid solidifying the position of the majors through oligop oligopolistic strategies and thereby curbing amateur behavior. And we are worried about the culture of amateurism and the threat that discrimination <coughs> poses to it. So they map differently, these different arguments. And one way of responding to this is to differentiate zones in which we'd want per se rules and zones in which we want rules of reason. So um, in particular, it seems that there's very few arguments in favor of allowing discrimination on the basis of content. The argument in favor of network neutrality here is extremely strong. Here, it's not quite so overwhelming, but pretty strong to disallow discrimination on the basis of sender. And the argument in favor of the toll-free principle is also pretty strong. The area in which the arguments are, are most sharply opposed is concerns application neutrality. This is the zone in which content uh, traffic shaping <coughs> management most often arises. And so if you were going to have a rule of reason in any context, it would seem to be here. All right, so that's a quick suggestion of some typology, and we should now open for discussion. We have to do. Thanks, Terry, Tim, Yochai. Um, I just, I actually have yet another argument for network neutrality and um, sort of, I think the ideology of the whole thing is based on the um, possibility that the network infrastructure could become so abundant that the telephone companies would have nothing to sell and that they're struggling to lock down their position and that they've largely succeeded and the network neutrality debate is um, a rear guard action against that. So um, I just want to, so that's my comment about your talk, Terry. Um, I'd like to point out that Tim and Yochai are operating um, through two, are seeing the world through two very different frames. Tim's frame is how do we manage scarcity? That's the telco frame. Tim's taking a decidedly independent look through that frame, but nonetheless, that's the old frame. Yochai admits of a new world where uh, there could be radical, this radical abundance that I posit. And uh, so I just simply want to point out that when we think of network neutrality, let's think in terms of how the argument is framed. Is it framed in terms of managing scarcity? If so, it's all about how the telephone companies can sell what they currently have. If it's in terms of radical abundance, we're talking about a new world with new institutions. I want to hold the data route back there. We have one over here, but there's another question. Um, I have a, I, I'm a, admittedly a novice, um, but I think, or I, I want to test out this theory that the question of net neutrality arises entirely from the fact that our little guy on the left has one choice, right? In other words, if our little guy on the left or the audience could choose from AT&T and also a variety of other providers, then it's not really an issue anymore. Like right. It's sort of like the grocery stores where I could go to, to a, a, a large chain grocery store 
um, and that would be analogous to the ISP that offers that, that treats every packet equally, although some things are slow, although connections are slower to my favorite sites. Or I could go to the specialty store that allows that only provides certain sites but provides them faster. It, in other words, I, I, I need to I need to understand is that true? Is net neutrality arising entirely from the fact that there's just our little guy on the left can only, only has one choice? Uh, I guess I, I can answer that. Um, are we answering or just? Uh, yeah. I think it's mostly based on that, yeah. Um, but that's not a, a trivial thing. It's been, people have been trying to overcome, I, I think the answer, first of all, is just yes. But I, in my opinion, and David and, and Yochai may, may disagree, that, the, you know, that last mile has been an enormous challenge, uh, an enormous problem that isn't sort of, well, why don't we just have 10? I mean, I think we spent the last 10 years, for example, Michael Powell, when he was a chair, said we're going to have five, we're going to have six last mile ISPs. There's been all kind, you know, sorts of efforts to, to take on that problem of having more providers in the last uh, mile. Some of them may have been disingenuous, but I think there is something, there is some difficult economics in that area. Maybe people will disagree with me. That that area, at times, there's a word that people use, it's just sort of a forbidden word. There is a, certain aspects of a natural monopoly to that last mile that have made it very difficult to overcome that problem of having that market look like the market for candy bars. Um, you know, when I was in the industry in the late 90s, there were all kinds of companies who made their business saying, well, we're going to solve the last mile problem. Some of them were going to do it with laser beams. Some of them really had that idea of crawling through the sewer pipes and putting fiber optics in people's toilets. There were a lot of companies that really said, we're going to solve this problem, and there's going to be a choice between 10 different pipes into your home, broadband over power lines. Every one of those companies, almost every one of those companies is dead, and we're down to two. Now, uh, David Eisenberg uh, calls that accepting the economics of scarcity, and I, I'm sensitive to that. I don't think we should uh, surrender at that point, but I also think that I would guess for the foreseeable future, the next 10 five years, ten years, we are looking at a monopoly, a, a duopoly or a monopoly in that area, and my question is, what do we do about that? Um, uh, I think both of these comments and question are, are, are closely connected to each other. There, there are different versions of, of this core basic question that we need to, in some senses, know as a matter of fact. I want to push back a little bit on the idea that in the last ten years what we've been trying to do is uh, solve the last mile problem. I think in the last um, seven years, we, and when I say we, I mean uh, the official uh, federal, uh, the official arms of the federal government intended to do this, uh, have right. been assiduously trying to prevent competition. Uh, they've been assiduously pushing toward a two-pipe duopoly. Uh, they've been backing off what was understood quite widely, I think, uh, in the transition uh, to require certain regulations that would allow competition. Uh, when we got the Spectrum Task Force report in 2002 that told us of the possibilities of Spectrum, uh, we didn't actually move forward. We still don't have white spaces. 700 megahertz was auctioned for a bowl of red pottage uh, uh, instead of actually an, uh, 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 a possibility of a genuine open out-of-the-box uh, user-owned mesh. Uh, all of the things were ideas that were there. Five, seven, ten years ago, not ten, but eight years ago. Um, so I don't think we've been trying. What we've been trying to do is make sure that not too much changes. And that's what I think we need now to push back on politically. Right. Um, but but let's, uh, let the, 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 there's one over here and one over there, and then route them as they go. There's, when you're done, can you route over there? And when you're done, route next to you. Uh, so I'm David Copeland with Nikepedia. Um, I thought, thought it was really useful to look at the different facets of net neutrality, which is generally just a single rubric. Um, and I wanted to suggest an, another argument, um, mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, against application neutrality. Um, not so much because I'm uh, an advocate of not having application neutrality, but just as something, I think, to consider. Um, uh, with respect to... Um, Jonathan Zittrain's uh, pointing out to us the sort of inherent fragility of the internet. 
Um, it's clear that in times of stress, some messages need priority. Um, messages for first responders, um, uh, messages that are in some way or another related to safety or national security. And clearly those applications need priority, so some sort of an application priority uh, infrastructure uh, needs to be in place. And that, I think, has, a, uh, has the effect of making other use of that uh, framework uh, more likely. Okay. Yeah, can I address that question? There's this, I appreciate the question. There has always been, uh, you know, I'm in a lot of arguments with telcos where I'm very rarely accused of being on the telco side, but rather accused of being a... You know, communist and everything, and um, one of the arguments. The <laughs> yeah, one of the arguments that uh, is often brought up is the one you're you're talking about about first responders, and there, I think there's a very straightforward answer for that, and this is something I've always understood: is we need to understand that there is a value to discrimination, and I, I think that was highlighted by what Terry was talking about, um, but that. You know, there's all kinds of discrimination that goes on all the time in society that's useful. When you hire somebody, they need to be good at their job and so on and so forth. But there's also an enormous value of non-discriminatory networks as well. And so the answer for all this first responder stuff and, and you know, what about telemedicine is those should be on private networks. You know, there's such a thing as private networks that are specifically designed for a specific purpose like, you know, and the idea that you should have people doing surgery on the public internet is just crazy. You know, there's the idea, well, how are doctors going to be able to do surgery over the public internet? And you're like, they shouldn't do surgery. They should... So duplicate the infrastructure to reach around the no, world? No, no, you just you set up... I mean, when I was... We, they already sell these things all over the place. If you're in the industry, they're called virtual private networks or actually private networks. And you buy a reserved amount of... Infra you buy a reserved amount of bandwidth, and it happens all the time. It's happening as we speak. Um, these are very common plans, and there's no reason that stuff should be on the public. The public internet should be kept a public place with this, where it's free from discrimination as possible. And this is what we have in regular society too. We have regular roads which are public, but we don't, you know, the, we, when, we, when possible, if something is really uh, needs a certain amount of priority, we put it on a completely different kind of lane. Yeah. So 911 over voice, uh, voice over IP? Well, should 911 over a separate separate uh, cable? I didn't quite put it that way. I'm just saying that when you are, I mean, some of these privacy, some of the private networks can be virtually private. But I think the rule is that the way the rule sh is and should be, or the, is developing is, if you're going to access the public internet as defined by the publicly defined internet addresses, you don't discriminate. And if you're going to ha set up a, a private network with private addressing and private prioritization, that's fine. Well, we have those all over the place. I mean, the cable network is a discriminatory network running on the same infrastructure as the Internet. And we're okay with that. Um, right? If you think about the, let me just repeat that to make it clear, the coaxial cable between your house and the cable plant has two networks on it. One is the public Internet, more or less non-discriminatory. One is a highly discriminatory, paid-for network called the cable network. They more or less coexist fine, and the problem is the standards of that private network creeping onto the public network. So that's what I'm trying to defend. And I'm saying if you want to have a national security network or a national, why run it on the public internet? That's crazy. You know, create a, create a separate, you know, reserve some bandwidth on all this physical infrastructure and devote that to these places. And you want to have like a 911 system, again, you don't need a separate wire. But you reserve some of that wire for that purposes. Just don't contaminate the public internet with these arguments. Okay. Yeah. Before, before we move on with, with yeah. more questions, I, I want to try to, uh, to, to tease out a little bit, Terry, uh, uh, your map, which is, which is new and I think very um, productive. But I want to push on one, um, I think, driving hypothesis of the last version of it, of the last slide. Uh, which is that the decisions are driven by uh, reason rather than politics. Uh, in particular, uh, the tension between uh, what Tim identified as a core, que the first question, the payments question, right. and your uh, reasoned uh, statement for why it is that there's a strong case for a rule-based uh, requirement on the toll-free Side. And so how do you see the 
to what extent do you see the tension between how much net neutrality is a politics-driven as opposed to a policy-driven issue versus its susceptibility to a reason-based solution? <laughs> Can you pass this line? Over? Sure. I feel like we're splitting a cup of wine or something. <laughs> we're sharing nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can be very brief because I have almost nothing to say in that front. Um, I, um, my sense is that uh, a necessary but far from sufficient contribution in this area is sorting out the arguments analytically more clearly mm -hmm. and uh, that they get seized uh, and tangled up um, in the political process. I uh, have no capacity to affect that. I suppose there, there does arise a strategic issue here that we have discussed in a loosely related context of intellectual property, namely uh, um, give them an inch, they'll take a mile, don't concede any um, benefit to any forms of discrimination because it will just be um, misused by, um, by, by opponents. Uh, that's definitely the, a hazard here. Uh, <coughs> But I, 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 my only hope here is to contribute at the academic level and contributing at the political level. I just no aspirations at all. There, there was someone over there. I have a, just a, a quick question in terms of we're talking a lot at the policy level in terms of network neutrality versus discrimination. Have there been any studies in terms of the end cost of the consumer of network neutrality versus discrimination in terms of how the consumer will pay one way or the other? Studies. No. I, I think the brief answer is uh, no. Uh, there aren't that many working uh, examples of competing systems like that. I, I can report to you what the um, arguments are. One of the arguments, uh, and then I'll go back to this diagram over here. So, this. Uh, Sorry, it's too close. One of the arguments that's often made in this debate is that, uh, well, the reason you got to allow payments, the reason that it, this is, you know, sometimes you'll say, well, eBay or, or Google, they're, they're free riding on the internet for free, right? They're using our pipes for free, and we ain't going to let them do that. And that's the argument that, there, that this payment should be made, this payment here. There should be a payment made from the companies like eBay or, or Google uh, that are on the internet over here so that in theory they might be able to lower this price here. Right? So they can say, you know, if the real price is 40 then maybe they can reduce it to $20 a month. Right? And then um, reduce this to $20 a month so then the consumer in theory pays less. That extra $20 a month is then somehow recovered over here in higher fees paid by eBay or, or Google um, doing more advertising. You see, they're, they're the big fight, one of the big fights about here is who's going to pay, really it's who's going to pay this cost. I guess the, one of the biggest fights is who is going to pay this? And is it going to be paid directly or can they sort of make this look cheaper, maybe more people will buy it, and then throw those costs over here. Now, to my mind, the big threat of that and maybe you'll have to jump in here, but the big threat of that is to the to, to amateurism, right? Because or to you know to low cost. Because right now, as as we all know, for if you're over here and you have just a tiny website, you can get on this side for for forty dollars or whatever and say something. But if it becomes something where you know you really have to contribute or make a big contribution to that last mile pipe before you kind of get heard, then that is the real threat to to uh, amateurism. So just a very complicated way of saying that. That these transfer payments, to my mind, well, they look like kind of a very arcane or, or, comp or you know, inside baseball kind of thing. That they are the threat to the nature of the internet. Because right now, the whole, I mean, often the industry will say, "Oh, we're just subsidizing all these companies, right? We're subsidizing this whole structure, is subsidizing eBay, subsidizing Google. They are making all their money and having fun, and we're suffering." 
Um, but, well, if it is, I don't know what you call a subsidy, but if there is a subsidy, that's why we have Wikipedia, that's why we have blogs, that's why we have citizen journalism, yeah. it's because you can just have this at all without having to make that big payment. Do you want to... No, David, you have data, you said. Um, you just want to, or, I, I, it's your question, but David seems to have data on this question. I, I don't have no, data. Oh, sorry. I didn't I'm sorry. I, I, um, but I do have a, one sure. quick point about the costs to consumers. Right. It's impossible to know what we don't have. So the claim is that the internet is as as a neutral uh, space has been a great petri dish for innovation. We don't know what's coming tomorrow, but the and so we don't know how to measure the loss to our children and our grandchildren. Similarly, we don't know how bad it's going to be when you know if hypothetically the incumbents really start uh, discriminating and censoring and all the kinds of bad stuff we we anticipate so I think inherently it's impossible to do those studies about what it will cost the consumer there is an element of belief here the, the this there was question so I think there's some confusion that happens that is Peter, I guess from the ear touch, by the way. Uh, there's some confusion that sometimes happens in the gray zone between uh, Terry's categories of content neutrality and application neutrality. Uh, and perhaps that was part of what uh, Devon and Tim were, were sort of going backwards and forwards about, which is that you can dis discriminate against not an application per se, but against certain characteristics of an application. Uh, if it generates a huge amount of traffic over a sustained period of time, uh, if it has a demand for uh, low latency and reliably low latency traffic, those are characteristics that are often highly correlated with one application or another, maybe not entirely, uh, but uh, you can discriminate on those kinds of grounds uh, but still be neutral with respect to application and with respect to, mm -hmm. to content in some senses. Right. Uh, and so it's important perhaps to remember that point and, and to emphasize it in these arguments that you know we can have a, a, a neutral market where you buy a certain amount of bandwidth and a certain amount of latency for, for your applications and if you need to do surgery you, you, you purchase a lot of bandwidth with a lot of good latency and you pay a lot of money for it. Uh, and so getting towards that point where you have that kind of the important neutral characteristics are teased out, you sell those and at whatever rate per market can get you them. Uh, and then you, you don't discriminate against the actual application that generated the, the, the demand. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, can, can I just, uh, well, go ahead. Maybe we'll take another question. Perhaps claim it is, uh, but that may not solve all the problems for a couple of reasons. First of all, right. 
there's lots of content that no ISP wants to carry right. uh, because they simply just don't have a great incentive to do so. And more to the point, even if one would and the rest wouldn't, that one company would go bankrupt quickly. So something spam peer to peer, you can think of some combination of circumstances in which actually there'd be a lot of content that, that all ISPs would like to hand off to other people and, and it's not profit making for any of them. Um, so I, I think that there may well be a non uh, a non competition element in which you can actually see all ISPs being opposed to certain types of content. And sometimes there's very good reasons for that. Uh, but sometimes it's just that they uh, they prefer not to let consumers use what the consumers want to use. Right. Um, so uh, so I, I think that there may be problems beyond the problems that you see here, um, which means that it, it won't go away just because we have competition, and it and that actually the regulator is not really tooled up to deal with this at all because if they're just looking for Madison River really smoking gun, right. they're not going to keep seeing smoking guns. They're just going to see vapor and not actually understand quite what's going on. Right. Do you want to say something? I'm, 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 there's lots of people in the room who okay. want to talk, so yeah. I, my inclination okay. is yeah, I agree. to let people in. So, um, I would let Paul Hoffer, former fellow at the Berkman Center, uh, now with no idea. I'd like to uh, present an argument against uh, part of Tim's proposal and to uh, support it with some data. The, the particular um, statement that you made that uh, seem not right to me is equating the um, activities of an internet supplier and a cable supplier. And uh, I, if I have, uh, if my memory serves me, uh, you said something to the effect that both of them um, need to get a bandwidth and a pipe uh, uh, to get access to an end user. And if it was not exactly that, then, then you could correct it. And so, uh, and I was kind of troubled with that. And then when Terry put up his um, his matrix, uh, I, I felt that that was a breath of fresh air in understanding the comments that I'll make. And so here's the data to support a different view. The different view is that uh, perhaps the, um, the, there are different kinds of neutrality um, among uh, uh, providers and, and applications and those different things. And if you uh, posit that the value of the bandwidth is not the same, then there's a lot of data to support it. And the data that I would give you is that the uh, eBay, for example, um, is buying basically bits and access to bandwidth and, and a channel to the end user. Whereas um, what we most uh, frequently call content or the kind of products that you would get up from a cable company, what happens is they take the value of what that bit might be and they increase it dramatically by surrounding it with um, programs and things of that nature with certain kind of content. And the evidence that it becomes more valuable is that they sell it to advertisers at much higher rates than advertisers would pay if the bandwidth wasn't surrounded by the particular kinds of content. That's the nub of what I'm saying. So to equate the cable company and what they're doing to the telephone company or to the eBay company and saying that really they're both doing the same thing, they're taking a kind of a commodity uh, value of bits and access to end users is to, I think, really neglect some of the fine grain that happens when you look at the different kinds of neutrality and the different kinds of issues that are there. Does that make sense to anybody? Um, well, uh, the two options. One, I was actually thinking of doing a, a, a lightning round rather than responding directly. I, I, but. I will say one thing, just because you're, you're suggesting it as an alternative model. If I understand you correctly, um, you're saying cable is different from the internet. And I think that was the point that Tim was I'm saying, saying don't that, let that, one bleed into the other. If you're doing internet, you're doing a certain kind of relationship to information right. that allows lots of different people to exchange lots of different information with a certain kind of architecture and a certain set of degrees of freedom and where they're distributed. And if you're doing cable, 
you're doing a very different operation that you say is wrapped in value and is valuable in a certain way, and that has a certain price that's attached to it. And those are two such fundamentally different projects that they need to be kept separate. And the concern is when the model from the one bleeds over to the other to the point that it will swamp it. This, I think, underlines right. this concern. That's right. Okay, but let's, so, yeah. uh, just, just maybe to clarify, I was using cable as an example that perhaps a bit isn't a bit isn't a bit, right. and that the idea that everything is all equal uh, might not be, uh, is maybe too simplistic. But the right. idea is that when you build a system where you treat a bit as a bit as a bit, right. you get a different cluster of knowledge structures and cultural structures developing in a different organizational model than when you self-consciously pre-build a system to separate out these different kinds of contents and give privilege to some as opposed to others. That's the nub of it for me. Yeah, no, I, I, let's, I, let's move oh, it uh, okay. uh, to the back there. I'm going to try to drop it over here. Okay. Who wants to? I, I have a question. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, this is, I really like the framework you laid out there, Tim. Um, oh, my name's Susie Lindsay. I'm a former fellow at the Berkman Center. Um, the, starting with number three, if you were to take sort of what I see as a case-by-case -case approach and, and end up with isolated questions going forward, um, and the question of what's reasonable and what is good discrimination and bad discrimination, um, I, I currently work for a large ISP that is traffic shaping, and the argument they make is that a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, or peer-to-peer -peer trafficking needs to be shaped so that they can they can service all the rest of their customers. And um, that would they would describe as good discrimination. And I'm wondering um, what the harm to the users and the peer-to-peer -peer systems are in terms of what the, if there's a corresponding bad discrimination. Right. First of all, I do, I do this is really to respond to you. It's nice to see you again, and, and also Chris is, a point about how this is developing. I, I, I think, just descriptively, that I'm going to repeat what I said, that I think this is developing in kind of a case-by-case, -case, almost common law method where, you know, ISPs are doing certain things and people are trying to figure out whether they think that's troublesome or not. And the two things that seem to me sort of the poles on which people are, are relying on is, first of all, to what degree, and I said this earlier, is the traffic management in question, something that is really done in a good faith multilateral way. That is to say, it's, it's something that is not, the one of the big problems with Comcast is basically they were throwing all the burden of BitTorrent onto other service providers and they were doing it secretly. Right? Everyone, does, everyone agrees that peer-to-peer that -peer, uh, systems create a lot of bandwidth, a, a lot of traffic demands. Um, as, so that, that, that's one, that it's sort of done in an open and, and multilateral fashion. And then the other question, and I think this is really important, important, is that you avoid the problem of application discrimination. And, and, and this I mean something slightly different than what Terry meant. By this I mean that you don't, to the extent possible, are not trying to pick and choose what are the winner technologies of the future of the internet. You know, you could have done this 20 years ago and said, well, you know, email and is really it, and Gopher, these are really the apps that people care about on the internet. And you could have sort of said, we're going to prioritize everything, so these work really well, email, Gopher, no one wants anything else. Um, and it's really hard to predict what people are going to want. Uh, you know, the internet keeps developing unusual things or going in different directions that are a little unexpected. And so the danger of any sort of throttling program, especially when it becomes less of a throttle and more of a block, is that you're sort of choosing you know, you're basically advantaging client-server models over P2P models. So that is what I think is the sensitive issue, is when you start having these particular players, in a sense, deciding what the winner applications are, and that's what I'm concerned about. But when it's done in good faith, you know, when everyone is trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this problem of excessive bandwidth use, that, that seems to me to be fine. And that's analogous to Yokai's point about um, mesh networks versus... Uh, uh, yeah, okay, right, yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, last, yeah, that's true. Last question. Yeah, uh, Jay Scott, former uh, Berkman intern. Um, I guess, so, 
Uh, I think everyone is going to agree that there are positive and negative aspects of discrimination, um, and that uh, the uh, dumber or more open the network, the less discrimination, the more technological innovation uh, that can be uh, allowed for. Uh, but I guess when we start to think about positive things uh, that can come out of discrimination, like the possibility of smart networks that allow for um, things like uh, tracking of content for the purposes of micropayments, um, and technologies that could allow for um, alternative means of uh, compensation and incentivizing for uh, creators and content providers. I'm wondering if we're uh, finding ourselves placed in a situation where, uh, on the side of increased neutrality, we can um, uh, preserve technological innovation, but um, I guess uh, inadvertently stymie policy innovation um, in terms of uh, how we deal with um, intellectual property. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> sure, right? I guess you've done this. So it's maybe. Um, I probably know. I'm intensely concerned with the development of alternative compensation systems, figuring out ways of facilitating the distribution of digital media so as to provide effective compensation to the creators without sacrificing all the benefits of the digital networks we've built up. So I'm, I begin with a presumption of strong sensitivity to this issue. On the other hand, the litany of problems that are associated with affording opportunities for discrimination of the sort listed on the right-hand side of the chart m m leads me to be inclined to give up the potential of using um, discrimination except in the application area as a vehicle for achieving compensation. Um, my willingness to do that, I suppose, is enhanced by my view that there are other ways of achieving an, an alternative compensation regime including um, mon monitoring with appropriate protections of anonymity and privacy, what goes on in individual computers, leaving the pipes um, free as a result. So uh, I, I, I share the premise, but I think it's not worth the uh, risk. I want to take this opportunity to answer the question that Yohai asked me in the first place which is what about open access? Um, it, the old word, and I, I, you, I would use this term too, the, that what happened to the focus on trying to increase the number of competitors in the, in the last mile, and why did we give up on this? Um, and should the focus be going back to that goal of trying to, um, is, this, is this an accurate characterization of what you're saying? That you know, Should the focus be on how can the federal government or other entities academics push for just an explosion of, of uh, competitors into the last mile. And I, I guess I, it's true, I think there is, to you know, be completely honest, I think there is a little divide, and I think Dave is right, a little divide between Yohai and I on, and maybe others in this debate. And the reason I have been less uh, focused on the issue of, of that of trying to, to increase the number of competitors uh, in, in the last mile is, I think, the following. Um, first of all, I, uh, there's a comment that Chris made, which is there's a problem of it not necessarily being uh, sufficient to solve the problems of discrimination. You know, any discrimination problem, there's two solutions. One is, this is something um, Richard Epstein actually says a lot, which is one solution is to have an anti-discrimination rule and another is to have more competition. So Richard Epstein in employment says, well, you don't need Title VII because you just need a lot of competition and then discrimination against blacks will go away. You know, and I don't think that, I think that's a, I, I don't think that, I don't think it's true in employment and I also don't think it's true in the network neutrality context. That is to say, even if you had a lot of competition, as, as Chris pointed out earlier, I think you might still have unified discrimination for either irrational or, or rational reasons. That's nonetheless bad. So that's one reason. Um, otherwise, I think that the unbundled network elements approach, you know, I think it borrows from this sort of 70s um, 
uh, Chicago school thinking, which had a certain strand of Chicago school thinking, which had an almost mythological faith in, in competition's ability to solve all problems. I, I, I feel this when I go and I hang out with the sort of the old economists, and they're saying, we need to introduce competition, introduce competition, even when it's not a likely area that there will be competition there. So maybe I am slightly more accepting, and, and I'm willing to accept criticism on this basis, of the idea that there are more, and I said this earlier, of a natural monopoly aspects to some part of this market than we're willing to, to accept. And uh, Yohai could say, well, that's because the government has accepted a death of competition in this area and hasn't prompted new areas. But I think at least for some of it, I don't know about wireless, but on wireline, I don't know whether even if you push everything you can to try and have there be five different wires into the home, each of which is whether that's sustainable or whether they will you know, tend towards a, a, a one or two wires. Um, maybe that's giving up the fight too easily, and I accept that criticism, but I think that that is where my intuitions lie, and that the effort to try and introduce competition um, may not be uh, as solve all the problems we hope it might. Yeah. Oh, let me say one last thing. The other thing I think, there's a lot more political or popular valence to the idea of net neutrality than there ever was to unbundled network elements. In other words, people will demonstrate, you know, people, there's a popular movement behind net neutrality and the idea of saving the internet, which never seemed to attract quite as well to the idea of select UNEP or UNEPL for reasons that... Now, maybe there was. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm speaking. Maybe there was... It was hard to get right. that network neutrality movement going. We didn't understand right. the threat in, back in the unbundled network elements days. Right. Well, it could be. Well, it just said, the government would let it go. Right. It just seems to seem more like a measure that's designed to help a certain brand of competitors more than a measure designed to um, sort of save something that everyone... Value. So I think that's another issue. Well, we need to give people a breather of a few minutes before the next set of uh, um, yeah. uh, panels uh, starts. Um, this is the second time in a month that somebody says that I'm like Chicago school. <laughs> um, right. Uh, still, five, seven, ten words. One, if in fact there is no competition, that's fine. Common carrier work, that's what started out with right. dial tone uh, ISPs. It was common carriage regulation. Right. It's this mockery of supposedly having a market, but carefully regulating it to assure that it's a duopoly that's creating the problem. So either market or non-market. Not right. a little bit of market, just enough to make a lot of money without giving actual competition. Second, it's also 10 years since I first wrote about spectrum commons. Right. And the core claim there was, ultimately, the only resource we had that was owned by no one and could be the basis for a user-owned network that is owned by no one, shared by everyone, and biased in favor of none, is feasible. We just haven't built it yet. Right. Step to think about um, uh, soon more uh, panels. Thank you.